Hi, my name is Chris Little, and I am the host of The Lifestyle Chase. In 2018, I started this show to have meaningful conversations. I've interviewed over a hundred different people, both in and out of the fitness industry. This podcast is something I'm incredibly proud of. Welcome to season four. Thanks for joining me. So welcome back to the Lifestyle Chase. This is crazy because I'm traveling and interviewing people now. So I've brought back, I think this is the third time you've been on the show. Lee Boyce, how are you today? Doing good, doing good. Uh, just trying to keep uh, keep busy, of course, but also just just staying with the, staying within that sort of equilibrium if I can. You know, I'm trying to trying to keep that keep that consistency going with everything that I got going on. And uh, it's quite a busy time, but I'm I'm making it work. I'm making it work. Absolutely. I mean, like. First of all, thank you for hosting me in your space for the show. This is the space, man. Very, very cool opportunity. I was glad that I was able to connect with you while I was doing my traveling. And just some backstory for the people that are listening or watching. I spontaneously decided to travel because I saw there was a deal on flights and it was 80 bucks round trip. And here we are. Just kind of sometimes you have to spontaneously create that work-life balance because I found that this past year has just been like foot on the gas the whole time, working like 60 to 70 hours a week. And now it's my time to sort of slow down while doing remote work. But I think the last time you were on the show was probably like mid-2021, maybe. Yeah. Um, what What's kind of transpired since then? Um, a fair amount, you know, like, uh, 2021, I mean, obviously there's a transition from virtual everything for most people in work related situations to being back in person with the pandemic sort of to making a little shift and mask mandates going away and, uh, restrictions going away in those regards. So that was a shift for me and I'm sure for a lot of other people in terms of, you know, how your time was kind of allotted and the demands on your time, um, how much Mobile, mobile travel yet to do and all that sort of thing. So that in itself was was a little bit of a transition. I had a summer, what is it now, the fall? Yeah, so I had the summer off of uh, teaching for school as well. So that was uh, a little bit of a transition because not only was the summer off of teaching and then I returned to school, but it was a summer off of teaching virtually and then I returned to in-person school. So like that sort of shook things up too. So um, yeah, no, I'm, I'm back to sort of full force with everything now, uh, client Clients have been uh, pretty consistent as far as being, uh, you know, full uh, full steam ahead. Uh, schools full steam ahead. Uh, got some long, long teaching days this semester, so I'm, I'm trying to sort of map, navigate through that. And uh, yeah, just trying to keep up with. See, this is the thing, right? It was with, with training, my own training. Um, when it was the pandemic time, you had so much more time. You could wake up whenever you wanted, and all kinds of stuff. Uh, that, all that's shifted. So before I could train so much more frequently and so much longer and whatever else I want to do. And you have the, the tools to recover from that too. You can sleep longer, you can, you know, focus on cooking your home cooked meals and everything is good. And uh, so that shift, that adjustment to now, okay, now I have to manage this, 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 and this, and it's all in person. And then I have to, uh, you know, uh, find places or times to train within that, you know, it expends a lot of your energy. So that's what I'm sort of navigating through as well. And um, it's, it's working out, sort of. <laughs> I mean, that's the most honest way to answer that. And that's a good topic to bring up because I know for myself, I've learned that I have to kind of like reframe how my personal fitness is. Like for this trip, my biggest focus is keeping my protein intake high and keeping my step count high. And I got a little workout in at the, the hotel gym and I do some like body weight stuff in the hotel just to kind of start my day, but not so much emphasizing uh, like a structured workout when I'm traveling yeah. just because of the amount of time that that takes up and then what I'd miss out if I did. But uh, what, what does sort of like setting the boundaries around your fitness routine look like for you like in the last couple of weeks? Uh, setting the boundaries around my fitness routine. Uh, like, honestly, the last couple of weeks, it means don't train when you don't have the steam for it. If I didn't have the uh, the gusto for it, or I didn't have the mojo going for me in terms of uh, training because of how busy my week has been or whatever, like 
I'm not doing myself all that much of a service to be trying to push the envelope and train on top of it all, you know. Um, had a few things going on as far as the musculoskeletal side, uh, side of things as well, where I've been getting worked on treatments and so on. So like just all of that sort of uh, piling on top of everything. Um, I mean, I'll take a few days between workouts because it's just what I can manage. And I think that's what sort of creates the, the that that feeling of balance and not overworking yourself, not making exercise become another stressor for you instead of um, it being you know what it's supposed to be, which is supposed to make you stress free. It's supposed to be good for you. So keep that in first mind, and I'll try to remind myself that you know training there will be tomorrow and the next day and X amount of years to train. So you don't have to get worked up if you miss your workout today, if you miss your workout tomorrow, or if you need to take a week off. Like it's fine not competing. I'm not trying to impress anybody and I'm not trying to, uh, you know, meet some kind of a standard or some kind of time sensitive requirement, just training for health, look good, feel good. That's basically it. So that's the name of the game. I'm not going to even remember what this period of time felt like, you know, in, in 10 years from now. So you know, just do what I got to do. If I got to scale it back and scale it back. Absolutely. I mean, like in the last two years, I uh, bought like an echo bike for my place. And then if I'm doing a lot of like computer based work, then I have access to something that is kind of scalable in the sense that you can just do like short spurts, longer duration stuff. It's right there. It's straightforward. If you have a like mentally overwhelming day, it's like a mindless task, but it's still like it still requires quite a bit of effort to complete it. You can't just like dabble around on an echo bike. Yeah. And I found that that change in my environment was like super important for this like phase in my career. Cause like where in the past it was like, hurry up and wait. Now it's like, there is a brick on the gas pedal and I like the brick to stay on it, but I need to like navigate that in some way, shape or form. Sure. But hopefully people are kind of understanding that like, Balance isn't really a thing that we actually achieve. It's just kind of something we get close to. Yeah. But um, as of late, like you've been doing some stuff with like good life and stuff like that. Let, let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And that's actually one of the things that I didn't mention when you were asking about uh, how things have been going and uh, the transitions. Like travel was another thing that was off the table for two years plus. Right. And so I don't know how a lot of my clients do it where they're traveling like literally like 150 days per year. I don't understand how people don't take into consideration that busy executive lifestyle where they're here, they're in and out in different countries, different uh, states, different whatever it is. Uh, and, and the toll that that process takes on somebody's body, you know? And I'm not even talking about bringing jet lag into it. I'm just talking about just the act of being at the airport, having to do your luggage, having to go travel, go up 37,000 feet, land, hustle, get back on the plane the next morning, maybe at 4 a.m. you have to be up and get your flight, and then you're back in the air. It is very hard on, I mean, I can only speak for myself, it's hard on me when I do that. And um, I only travel, you know, X amount of times per year, maybe like a handful of times per year for whatever speaking things I gotta do. And so that transition, when I didn't have to do that sort of thing, like, first of all, like it's a load off in a way, but at the same time, like when you transition back into doing it, it's like, it really is jarring for you. You know, you might be glad to be able to get out, but at the same time, it's, it's jarring, man. And so it really, really, it hits me hard and it hit me hard. Um, back earlier this year, I went to uh, Florida so far. I've gone to uh, LA as well. And then I've gone to um, Colorado and I guess all three of those involve some kind of, uh, you know, two of those three places involve some kind of a, a time difference, right? And you feel it, you know? So imagine now you've got to go to like Thailand or you've got to go to like China or something like that, like where you're going with a serious time difference. You're traveling from Toronto to Bulgaria. That's a massive change in terms of like your day is being flipped on its end. And so, um, yeah, it's just, it's a lot. But having said that, with Good Life, um, yeah, I've been in this partnership now. Did my first one here in Toronto, so uh, that was good. Gave a nice barbell clinic, uh, so full day seminar. I uh, got the next one coming up, which I'm actually yet to announce on uh, on my social media, so that people can start getting tickets for it. But that's going to be in Burlington, so it's just uh, west of uh, the, the Toronto area. Um, so that's another uh, event. Same thing. It's just going to be uh, the barbell clinic. Talking about leverages, talking about anthropometry, talking about uh, just how to coach Q, what things to think about. This is a good, it really, really went well the first time around. So I'm looking forward to repeating it this time. 
And then uh, after that, I think it's on to Winnipeg. So that'll be sometime later in November, if I'm not mistaken. I've got to talk to the head of education with that. But uh, it's it's all sort of looking like it's set up and it's moving its way into 2023 as well, as far as uh, what location, what destinations are going to be there. But it's going to ultimately and eventually become something where I'm going around pretty much the country, different locations, different, uh, you know, flagship sort of spots and uh, delivering this for the good life, uh, the good life base. So I'm excited for that. And, uh, you know, it's it's the area that I'm passionate about. It's an area that's my wheelhouse as well. So I don't loathe talking about this content. I, I look forward to being able to keep delivering. And I have a lot to say about the content too, a lot to share. So it's great. I mean, that's exciting. But the one thing that, well, I, I guess there's a few pieces to unpack. First one I'll talk about is the travel piece. Because I was actually thinking about that like last night. I was thinking about like how my body felt after like long periods of time sitting in a plane or even just like the bus transit that I was doing, just like being seated in environments where you wouldn't normally be seated and that time change, um, it's kind of, it's, it's pretty integral to be aware of that kind of stuff when you're someone who is wanting to improve. Because if we look at it in the big picture, like everybody's gonna die at some point, for us to progress to where we want to go, we have to kind of like be very um, picky about what areas get our time. So like if I want to be the most healthy, most fit version of myself, I would have to like put limits on the amount that I travel or at least in the ways that I travel. Because if I do too much of that, it'll hold me back from the other things, which kind of segues into the next piece here. So you're going in and doing a lot of work where it's going to involve travel, but you also have articles that are featured in different publications. Um, So you got a lot of different buckets that you're working with. How do you decide which buckets you're going to prioritize? What's kind of like the system for like moving forward with that stuff? So I don't know if it's so much a system, just more so how things sort of end up panning out. Um, When I'm really busy with some stuff, the other stuff suffers. And if people who've been watching, I guess, a little bit more closely with what I've got going on compared to uh, people who are more loosely involved with it, uh, they'll notice that article-wise, I've been writing way less this year, this entire year. And uh, there's a lot of reasons. There's other projects that are going on in the background. There's more, uh, you know, in-person coaching that I've been doing, for example, or school takes up more of my time and whatnot. So, you know, the values shift in terms of what, takes your time, what gets your time, what what occupies your time and space. And uh, so, yeah, like I haven't written too many articles this year by comparison to like 2020 or 2019 or whatever other year you want to name. Um, it's just different. It's just different. Now, <clears throat> I'm kind of okay with, I'm pretty good with uh, being able to ramp things back up when I need to or when I want to. Um, so I do plan or intend to bring it back when I have certain things in you know, my worlds that I can sort of just like finally put down to rest to rest and then I can get back to this stuff instead. But it's just different areas of my work that have taken up more of my time. And then once they're sort of done for, then I can go back to the writing stuff. And uh, that's the way that I sort of manage everything when it comes to, uh, when it comes to my, uh, my work, not just writing, you know, um, school, school wise, I'm just trying to think a couple of semesters ago, it was over the pandemic, but I was running a program. I was running one course and uh, it's the on-campus internship for the students where it's like it's an immersion into like the fitness world, personal training world, all that stuff. And uh, it's one thing to teach the labs for it where you're you're working with them hands-on, one-on-one doing things like that, or sorry, one-on group doing things like that. But uh, when you have to run the whole course as well, that means you have like, you know, a hundred and something students you've got to work with and you are managing all of them and doing the internship portion of it, which is where they're working with the client themselves. So you have to oversee all of that. Plus you have to give them assignments. Plus you have to give the lectures for the class. Plus you have to look at uh, percentages in terms of their, their grades and all that. Like it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work, you know? And when you're running the lab of that, you have about, you know, one third of that responsibility. It's a very different sort of dynamic. So um, yeah, there was a period during that time where I was running that course for the entire semester. And uh, I was not only running that course, but I also had two, I believe, labs that I was teaching at the same time for the same class. So it was like most of my week was dedicated towards school. So my online coaching had to suffer a little bit in terms of like, you know, having volume or having clients that I worked with. Um, you know, my, my, others, my other priorities, writing included, like, you know, I just took less deadlines. I took less assignments. 
it's just how you have to do it, right? And again, like you said, to get to where you want to be as far as like, you know, just maintaining a healthy, balanced version of yourself, you can't be trying to, you know, throw all your eggs into every single basket that's available. It's just not going to be sustainable. And it doesn't work that way, especially not when you're not 21 or 22 and you just have endless amounts of energy anymore. Because like, I'm 35, I, I, I get tired now, like I burn out easy, like it's different. It's just a different time. So that's sort of how I've been uh, approaching it lately. It's a good reminder as well, as far as like, uh, you know, you, you can't do it all. You can't do everything every single time. So just chill out, take it easy. And, you know, the world will still go along if you don't write as much in 2022 or something like that. So, yeah. It's true. I mean, the, the point that you brought up that stood out to me the most was just like pointing out how like you're still writing articles, but the volume is much less. And I can relate to that with my podcast. Like there's been some years where I put out like 70 episodes within the year. Yeah. That's a lot. <laughs> and this year, I think it's probably been more like, uh, like 10 episodes within the year. Like there's some months where I'll just do one episode. But the thing that I've sort of changed is that now my intent is as I do episodes, more and more of them are going to be in person, like even incorporating travel. There's been some guests that like the first time I interviewed them, they were in Iceland. And then the next time I interviewed them, they came to Edmonton. Yeah. And it's just kind of like being able to do the same things, but not dedicating more time to it, but dedicating a different level of energy to it. So then I get that much more fulfillment out of this bucket of mine and still make it towards my goals. And it's just kind of that less is more concept where like I'm still moving it towards the direction that I want to move it because I'm still getting better at like interviewing and listening, but then I'm actually getting the one-on-one -on -one connection with people that like, that lights me up. Like the people that I interview, like I, I like to visit them because then it's just like, this is who that person actually is in real life. And this is where they dwell and exist and stuff like yeah. that. So hopefully people understand that sometimes it's like they don't have to like do a whole shit. Like they don't have to outwork people. They can almost like reflect on like the quality of their efforts and see where they might be able to do it better and just do the one rep better than they would have otherwise. Yeah. Um, but it all kind of, for me, all of this kind of revolves around goals that I have for myself. But what are your goals that kind of drive you as you're moving forward? Like, where do you want to be when you're 40 years old? Yeah. Um, it's always sort of been a thing that, and I was going to speak to the points that you were making there that like part of it for me has uh, always been about, okay, no matter what, okay. People see that you're writing less articles, for example, right? And people know that you write a lot of articles usually. Well, just because you write less, don't make it that you're writing less just because you're being lazy, right? You've got something going on. You've always got things on the go. You've just got your time and your attention has shifted to certain other things that are still working you towards those goals that you might have, right? Um, you know, in my case, I've always said that the goals that I have just be respected in the industry, you know? And that seems like a very vague term to use, but it, it goes layers deeper. You know, respect from clients, respect from your peers in the industry and what kind of doors all that stuff can open, what that's going to have you remembered as, as time goes on, what's going to happen when you have, you know, products out there or some kind of business or certification program or whatever it is that you want to run. How is that going to be reflected in uh, whether or not you're respected by your peers? If you don't have any respect from your peers, then you say, okay, yeah, I've got this thing that's coming out, this big thing that I'm launching, or I have this uh, cert program that I'm launching, but nobody likes you and nobody believes in your stuff. Well, how well is that going to do? You know, so that has always been my thing is that I want to be respected amongst my peers and amongst obviously the general population, uh, my clientele too. And uh, that drives some of the things that I do. Um, it drives a lot of the things that I do for, you know, even pro bono uh, purposes. And it drives a lot of the things that I do that are not for pro bono. I want to break into this magazine or break into that magazine and whatnot. Um, so that's, uh, that's always been the prime motivator to, to, to get me to do the things that I've done and things that I want to do going forward as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I often, I mean, I get super introspective all the time, but when I'm sort of reflecting on, for me, it's mostly just like my experience with social media and just like how I interpret things and what I notice in other people's behaviors. And I tend to notice that like, it doesn't matter what you put out, people take it out of context or they kind of project their own like version onto something. And I've realized to kind of like distance myself from it because it's easier for me to move forward in my own goals if I kind of sever separate myself from it but there's still like a little like piece of the space 
that means something to me. Like when, when we're talking about being respected by our peers and stuff like that, um, like at the end of the day, I want people to know me as like a genuine, very transparent, like thoughtful, caring person. Like I don't want anybody to get it twisted that I'm like somebody that I'm not, but it's hard to kind of like, decide what it is that determines when you've made it to that thing. So for you to be well respected in the field by your peers and stuff like that, what is it that you would kind of loosely say would be the thing that kind of determines when you've reached that point? I think when the people who I looked up to the most when I was getting started out or when I was really getting immersed into learning the most and so on, when those people start, you know, mentioning myself in kind of the same breath as them in a way or including me in certain things that they've got going on and stuff along those lines. Like, again, that's a little bit of a vague roundabout answer, but what I mean by that is, for example, a nice full circle moment was when um, Joe DeFranco wanted to do an interview with me as well. Did an interview just like this one here. And Joe DeFranco for years and years and years have been watching, reading, studying from, following his website. Some of my, promo I made a promotional video when I was um, 22, I think I was. Um, and it was just a montage of just different, me training different clients and just promoting my stuff, right? Um, training clients and training myself and just like a nice little montage. And uh, it was a good trailer. It was like a minute long or so. And uh, I did that. It was a full carbon copy of what DeFranco had on his site with his football guys. All these people lifting chains and people who were doing high box jumps and all kinds of stuff like that. And it's funny because I told him this on his show when I was doing a show. And I was like, yeah, like I full-fledged copy you because I was so impressed by it and I wanted to be just like you so I did the same thing or a version of the same thing relative to the general population so I was in the gym and I had cuts of me doing a, a snatch and then I had cuts of a client doing some Turkish get-ups and then some cleans here and, this, and it was pretty awesome I mean it was not even close to the quality of what he had but it was the inspiration for it and so uh, that just goes to show that like you know, these people who I looked up to so, so much now to be able to say that I'm connected with them, that I can, you know, shoot them a text or whatever, or that I can be on their programs, their shows and whatnot, or that I can get their endorsement for certain things that I have going on and vice versa. Like, and that my opinion might matter to them too. Like those things are very important to me. And so that's a good indicator, I think, to answer your question in terms of like whether or not you've gotten to a certain point career wise or in your life or in your, in your uh, industry that uh, you feel like some of the fruits of your labor have been have been uh, accomplished or, or met and you can experience and enjoy those fruits of your labor. So, um, yeah, I think that, that that is an indicator of some of the respect that I've been after and being mm -hmm. uh, fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And that, that makes sense. That's super clear. Like, for myself, one of the things that I've had to do is just, like, I follow dog accounts, donut accounts, sandwich accounts, and, like, my friends like people who are like getting married and having kids whether they be in the industry or not um just people that just i feel better when i see their stuff and then when that is the only thing i'm focused on in like the general social media space then i'm able to actually realize when i'm actually hitting like landmarks because what i've found in like the past i have not celebrated any wins because i'm always i'm so focused on someone that's either like bringing people down or i'm focused on something that's not even real like i'll see somebody's like celebrating something and then if i actually went to like their house and checked it out it's like they celebrated it prematurely and i've just found that shift in my use of social media to be so helpful because like if you let it take you down it totally will and like it it agitates me often and i've muted the crap out of a lot of the industry because it just uh at the end of the day the only thing that matters is our individual human experience yeah. like for me to be able to actually like as i'm traveling here i'm putting in some work so i'm generating an income and i'm able to do whatever i need to do and I had to Uber home or Uber back to the hotel yesterday. And I didn't have to like squirm and be nervous like I would have back in 2019. Like uh, to kind of like tell a bit of a side story. When I first came across you in person was at the 2019 Kansas City Fitness Summit. Yeah. Um, in order for me to attend that event, I had to ask my parents and my siblings for money for Christmas. And that's how I paid for like all of the, the speakers and stuff. And then I think I put like the flight on my credit card or something like that. And 
I got there and I was like, there was very little room for error. And when like the first meal I had, I ordered like $15 with McDonald's. <laughs> I was like sweating bullets if we ever had to go anywhere. So I know I bummed a ride from Andrew at least once yeah. and Derek Stanley drove me around a lot and uh, Chase drove me around and just, I was like fly, like just barely grinding through, but it afforded me the ability to just be there. And then that helped my career quite a bit just with the connections made and the experiences had. But then now, like three years later, I can go on the plane, I can go check things out, I can go see the aquarium, all these things. I don't have to worry about it as much. And so no matter, like, I realized people can think I'm like a chump on Instagram, like just not doing anything. But the truth is I've, I've crossed so many like milestones personally that I've learned to just only care about that. Yeah. Like, because yeah, it's just, it's wild how sometimes we forget to give ourselves credit. Yeah, that's a huge, huge point that you're making because I think first of all, that people in general are, are going to have, I don't know, I guess more industry specific fulfillment when they have stories like yours in some degree where it's like they had to, you know, work really hard or grind or go through some of this sort of, you know, not as pleasant times to be able to be able to be here, right? And, um, you know, I can relate to stories like that myself as well from, from when I was younger and uh, what I was like when I was starting out in the industry. First of all, starting out in the industry, but second of all, when I went on my own in the industry and do my own thing, there's like two sets of those stories as well. And uh, yeah, it wasn't all peaches and, and roses and rainbows by any means. But um, yeah, like if you take that concept now, and you transition it over to fitness and training. It's like a twofold message that you're sending. Cause like a lot of people will be quick to judge someone who lives with poor form, for example, who doesn't train consistently or who doesn't choose the right, who doesn't choose the most uh, um, applauded exercise selections or methods or programming choices, right? And we forget about the fact that, okay, well, what about their personal situation? What's their story? Is there a reason why they go and do cardio all the time and that's it? Is there a reason why they're only using half reps or they never squat or deadlift and they always do these machines or something like that? Is the things that we don't have explained to us that they have the answer for, right? And it's not to say that everybody should be uh, exempt from, you know, some discipline when it comes to training and whatnot. But, you know, what if that person's battling with some serious illness or they have this and this medical situation or so on and so forth that we don't really think about? When people are filming other people in the gym lifting poorly or lifting with bad form or whatever it is, and they're posting that video to get a laugh out of their audience, like, if you really think about it, it's an extremely rude thing to do. And it's a very, very um, low IQ thing to do as well, because you're not considering what other factors. Let's take it to the thing that you're talking about, to tuning out people who are bringing negative energy to the picture, right? That's probably the smartest thing that you can do, because you don't know what's going on in their life, right? And in their life, maybe... Maybe we're dealing with someone with severe mental health issues, right? And they're dealing with that stuff themselves. And the way that they conduct themselves on social media is, you know, in no way, shape or form how they'd like to, but it happens, right? They might have some serious issues with communicating. So if we get fired up and try to match them with, you know, our intelligence quotient being at a certain place, with our, um, you know, mental fortitude being a certain place, with our reasoning skill and logic skill being in a certain place, and it might not be matching what theirs is, it might be greater than that, then what are we really doing? What are, like, how are we benefiting anybody? What, what utility is there in being that kind of a person, right? And reminding ourselves that we don't have everybody else's full story and total story, whether it's in a life perspective, whether it's in a training perspective, or whether it's in a, you know, internet arguing, whatever troll sort of perspective. I think that goes a very long way. It's something that I sort of try to apply as well, where it's like, listen, I don't know this person's story. And uh, yeah, I'd rather just not join in the argument. So there's no point. So, yeah. I mean, one of my biggest reflections when I'm like, I'll try and be like, okay, why is this person like this? Like why, why is it always attacks? And then I think about it, I'm like, well, have I ever felt like just waking up and choosing violence against a person? And I'm like, generally not, not really. Like I got some other stuff on the go and I've got things that I want to do. And I want to like call my parents and visit my siblings and meet up with a friend and stuff. And like, that's what occupies my priorities. And then I'm like, okay, so 
what if I didn't have those things? And then I had all this extra time and I'm looking at stuff and I'm kind of feeling bad. I'm like, okay, like clearly everything is pointing to something is not the same for their situation as mine. And the best way that I can kind of like mediate that is just by like putting out the fire. And sometimes putting out the fire is just like putting some separation. And there's an example story that I'll use. that will make this easier for like any general population people that are tuning into the show. I once, well, I frequently go to Canmore. Um, and I like to go to Canmore to check out the breweries. And in a lot of cases, because I... I'll go on hikes and stuff, but I'm not the kind of person that goes up like the scramble of the mountain to go and get the picture for Instagram because I just hate the feeling of like falling down the cliff like I'm going to die. Um, but in this instance, it was like a two day trip and the trip was like planned around going to this Canmore brewery. And so I got to my hotel, got all settled down and I walked over to the brewery. It took like half an hour each way. And I got there and I tested out this flight of beer. And when I ordered, I was like, choose absolutely anything. You have my full trust. I love your brewery. And then I went and I reviewed all the beers and I like put them in my, in my Instagram story. And I think I gave one of the beer like six out of 10. And then like I, I had tagged them. So they reposted it and some guy, ironically, his name is Mike from Canmore. <laughs> like, so it nice. kind of goes along with the joke, but it's just like, of course your name's Mike. Mike from Canmore. But <laughs> he got so mad at me because his portrayal of my beer review was different than how I wanted it to be put out. Um, so like a six out of 10 on a beer, I would still like buy a case of those and share them with my closest family because like I've never come across a 10 out of 10 beer and it's just that it was kind of like it wouldn't be the kind of thing that you'd have for like a game of beer pong it'd be the kind of thing that you sit down and people are helping you move and you don't want them to get too drunk after they help you move so it's like a, a porter kind of thing right but this person got it so twisted and he just started like going off on a rant on me in my DMs and saying that I was a menace to the Canmore tourism industry and that he hates when people come in and are all uppity. And I'm like, holy cow, yeah. Mike from Canmore, like yeah. calm down. So I blocked him. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, it's, I can relate stories, uh, obviously more of training related stories that like, but it's the same kind of thing, like kind of like what has to happen in your life for you to have to get so much animosity and so vicious towards people on the internet, specifically on the internet, right? And are you that kind of a person in real life? You were face to face and you had the same sentiments that you felt in your heart about whatever content that I was sharing. Would you raise your hand in my lecture and would you say those things the same way, eye to eye? And that's where people usually realize that there's a discrepancy. There's a deviation from, you know, internet behavior and in-person behavior. They hide behind their monitors, hide behind their screens or their phones or whatever, and be a certain way. Um, you know, it can reflect on, I mean, that makes me ask a lot of questions. How were you raised even? Like, there's a lot of different things that go into that. But, um, you know, it's just funny. It's just funny. You can't give such ones much of their time, especially if their interpretation of what you had to say was incorrect in the first place, right? Where we have to go way back and let's start with actually you getting what I was trying to say first before you list your issues that you had with the content, right? And uh, that happened to me last year um, when I was, uh, when I put out, sometimes I make some tweet posts on my Instagram, I re repost a tweet and uh, you know, the wording was pretty straightforward, but decided to get it interpreted a certain way by maybe one or two people. And so they got upset about that. I didn't engage. And so then that started this whole cascade of their people getting upset based on that first person's interpretation of it, right? And mind you, there were people, many people who were on the thread, because this actually did very well, that post itself. Like a lot of people, they liked it and they shared it, they, they agreed with it and so on. So there are a lot of people who were like, yeah, I get what you're saying, 100%. But then that group and their their folks, they were all just like really wild, wild up about it. And, um, you know, it's just once it's gotten so far beyond repair and it's gotten to a point where it's so far gone, it just, you know what? Distance is the best idea. So I did my string of blocks as well. I did my mutes. I did all the things that I needed to do because if they want to spend their energy on my page doing this to disparage me, like, just why not make your own posts? And stuff? Like, if you have a different feeling, what's wrong with that? 
Why is it that none of the industry people that I respect or have respected over the course of my career are engaged in any of that behavior themselves? Mm -hmm. None of them, zero of them will go and pick wars and do all this stuff and scour the internet looking for people that they disagree with so that they can go on their thread and say this stuff. It's, it's idle. It's very, very, you know, anyway, I don't want to start, you know, taking shots at people or anything like that. But what I will say is that it's like, there are so many better ways to preserve your mental health, first of all, and preserve your time and like so much better energy that you could put into the industry and making it better. Because a lot of them will mask themselves and say, I'm a crusader for what's true and what's good in the industry and what's right. But I mean, is that really the way to do it? Are you going to, are you going to make friends doing it that way in terms of like, okay, if you really want the, the state of the industry to improve, then being this kind of pseudo villain, it's not going to do that for you because remember what I said that I want, I want respect from all my peers, right? And I don't think that's the best way to garner that respect. Even if your content and your ideas are correct or good and they're coming in from a good place, your behavior in this industry and in this whole world matters. And you could choose to ignore that or you could choose to take that in and 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 streamline how you want to present your ideas and how you want to be as a human being to another human being who's trying to do the same good stuff, the same from the same good intentions that they have, right? So anyway, sorry, it gets to a pretty loaded place as far as like how much uh, how much how much rabbit hole we could go down with that subject, but. Uh, it's very interesting. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, because it gets from fitness content and being a fitness professional, just being like an ethics professional, just like the ethical and like just the human transaction, you know, and uh, human interaction. And that's like, that's another subject right there. Absolutely. I mean, like, I'm pretty sure I remember even that post. And it's just like, for me, it reminded me of what I'm in the industry for. Like, I don't need to be like well recognized or famous or anything. I just want the interactions that I have to be like genuine and quality. Like that's why like an actual interview like this means more to me than it might to another person. Um, and like an example of mine, where a moment where I realized like what matters to me in the industry. Uh, one of my friends, I think you might know her, uh, Katie St. Clair. Yeah. Um, so her son actually got in a car accident. And when I saw that, I was like, oh man, like I feel like, like a family member it got hurt because that's kind of like the connection that I like to make on the platform. And like, I know that not everybody, I'm not going to be everybody's cup of tea. Like some, some people probably make fun of me on social media for some reason that I don't understand. But I realized that if I just place more emphasis on like how much I care about people, um, then that, that's the only thing I have control of. And so like there was a GoFundMe that got put out. So I was able to contribute to that. And then I recently listened to an episode that Katie put out where she talked about just her experience with that. And like, heck, if I put in a few decades into this industry down the road and I look back on my experiences, the things that are going to mean more to me are the times that people gave me a car ride, the times that people came on my show, um, just the positive feedback that's really resonated with me from guests about the show, um, the people who trust me with their business. Like I work for two other fitness businesses and I work for a social media business. Um, that's huge. And those are going to be my trophies. Like I could have 500 followers on Instagram and I'm not going to care. And like, it's just sometimes we have to realize like, who are we if our phone's in the garbage? Like, wh what do we have then? What kind of a human experience do we have then? And so hopefully if there's anybody that's kind of like getting stuck in like the rabbit hole of the space, they're able to kind of like latch onto something that actually means something because so much of just the space doesn't matter. Like our interactions that we might have with our colleagues on Instagram, that doesn't matter to our clients. It doesn't matter to people paying our bills. They don't care. Yeah. It's more so like, what kind of a human are we? Like, how do we show up for people's lives? And like, how much do we care about our people? And like, what are the things that we're doing when like, uh, when nobody's watching? Yeah. And I mean, just like, even just adding context to our mutual connection with Andrew Coates, like he's been someone who 
was able to help me in big ways in a few instances in my career where like when I was trying to hustle for work right like weeks after I quit my old career, he set me up with a snow removal job and we were right beside each other chipping away snow and ice at his client's property. And I got paid quite well for that. And that supported me for those two weeks because I just needed cash work. And just, he gave me the nudge to go to the Kansas City Fitness Summit. And because of that, I work with Alex McBrarity with some of his online clients and stuff like that. So it's just, it's neat when we're able to focus on like quality connections. And what I would say is the thought that I've had, if I've ever had any negative interactions or seen negative interactions among people that I care about, I'm like, I wonder what would happen if they sent him a Zoom link and just be like, I'll be there in 10 minutes. See you face to face. You ready? Like, I think sometimes we need to remember, like, with what we're about to say on the internet, if that person sent us a Zoom link and was like, okay, I'll be there five minutes, be ready, yeah. uh, camera on, like, how would they react then? Because sometimes we have to, like, think about it and, like, how do you compose yourself when you're walking down, like, a dark alley and those people are coming right for you? Like, are you going to get through that um, and be okay? Or are you going to have to face the consequences of what you've just done and realize that like, you can't just like say whatever you want to say to other people that also have autonomy and ability to do things. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, it's an interesting uh, thing that you said there about like the zoom link thing. Like I remember um, during, uh, we are probably talking about the same fiasco when it comes to that, uh, the tweet and all that stuff. Um, during that whole debacle, um, I did end up getting on the phone with one person who approached the subject from a, I disagree, but much more in a respectful manner where I'm encouraging or in, inviting discourse or dialogue, you know, it's like, listen, this thread has gotten way too toxic based on what I see here. And like where there were subsequent posts made on other people's stuff that were disparaging me and all. And like, listen, like I do whatever you want to do. Like that's, that's on you and that's your decision. And <laughs> whatever becomes of that down the road is, you know, that's on you, right? However, um, this person was more respectful and he wasn't part of like really the, the trenches of that discussion. So it's like, let's get on the phone. Let's, let's arrange to have a call. We talk about it and other stuff. So we did. And like an hour later, you know, our phone call, like it was a pretty positive phone call. It was a phone call where lots of common ground was found. And um, there was a lot of, you know, just mutual respect that was given. And yeah, it was, it was much better than, it was just a very different tone than what would have been projected, at least on the internet or what people would have expected some kind of a heavyweight battle back and forth. And it wasn't like that, you know? And so again, it just goes to show that face to face or voice to voice or whatever you want to say, things change when people's uh, attitudes change, people's behaviors change. And uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's funny you said about Katie St. Clair because she actually was somebody who was, uh, he, she came into support a lot and say like, you know, a lot of things against that kind of culture that's out there in the, uh, in the world of social media. And, uh, you know, it, it does ring true. Like, I don't personally feel like I have the time to be able to, you know, go and be a troll to other people who are trying to, you know, in good intentions, that is, because there are people who are very egregious with their, with their, their actions, but uh, in good intentions, who are trying to, you know, help fitness industry or whatever industry they belong to. I just don't have the time to say, okay, you know what? I read it. Not only do I disagree with it, but I'm going to write this 500 word dissertation on your comment thread and show you how horrible of a trainer or professional you are. You know, it's like, I just, I can't, I don't, I won't do it. I don't care enough, but I also don't have the time to do that. What I care about is giving my platform the time that it needs to put out the content that I believe in. And, and here's why I believe in it. Right. Um, Cause it's going to help a lot of people out. And so you know, from that standpoint or from that vantage point, I think that, um, you know, it, it just marks a difference between kind of like the the people who are more like, I don't know, sayers or, or the, the dreamers or thinkers versus the ones who are going to go and do stuff with their time, you know, do things that are productive with that time. And um, I think that that always sort of rises to the people who get A, the most respect, but B, the most industry specific accomplishments as well. And you know, those are the ones who I want to emulate. Those are the people who I look up to and I want to keep it that way. So, you know, it's, uh, again, like when you think about a bigger picture, like we were both talking about 
things that happened in our pasts as far as like the grind, the struggle, the hustle, and uh, you know, how that can round you out, how that can sort of shape who you became later on and uh, better appreciation you might have for certain things down the road. Um, yeah, I think that everybody kind of who's gotten to a certain place and done certain things in this industry, they have some version of a story like that to share too. And uh, it speaks a lot of volumes in terms of what that really means in the big picture. That means that like, you know, you're not looking around for handouts and you're not going and passing off judgment on other people who are doing a better job of something than you might be doing. You know, you're trying to find what you can to learn with. Will you agree with 100% of what everybody says? No, no one will. That's not possible, right? But what can you find that you do like from what they're doing? Maybe it's a horrible content post, but the way that it was made was a great idea. Maybe it was a post that had, you know, poor marketing or poor, uh, what's the word, uh, the poor, uh, uh, poor know, copy the actual, or yeah, the optics of it weren't good or whatever. And like all just the way that it was made, it was sloppily made, but the content was brilliant. You know, what are the good things? Maybe 75% of the content was horrible, but there's 25% that maybe was dealing with less training and more personality or ethics or whatever. And that was brilliant. And so why can't you look at things from a glass half full perspective where you know, you're not looking at things to deduct and ways to lower their grade, right? But you're looking at things to like, okay, well, that can definitely bring it up, right? And you're, you're thinking things from more of an optimistic perspective. And I think that that is a, a telltale sign of a lot of professionals out there who I respect, who I look up to myself. Um, they, they sort of have that optimism. Um, you know, I'm, I'm friends with and I'm colleagues with and I'm, uh, I'm uh, connected with a lot of coaches out there who in some cases people love them or they hate them, you know, and that isn't like, that's the least of my concerns because we have things in common and I find things that I like about them, which is why I still have, you know, a connection to them. I follow them or I'll use some of their content, you know, and the stuff that I don't necessarily agree with, that's fine. You know, just move on to the next post or, you know, I might post some content that's a little different from what they believe in and that's fine too. And guess what? They're not warring with me and I'm not warring with them. And I think that that's sort of the way to compose yourself in the industry. And it's going to, it's going to lead to a lot better outcome in the big picture. And people see that too, right? Like not only other contemporaries in your industry, but like your clients see that potential clients see that, you know, their clients see that, you know, what happens when somebody who's a client of that person who's controversial becomes a follower of you yourself, but then you're going disparaging that person or vice versa. Like they're going to be like, Oh, well, I mean, that doesn't seem that professional. I mean, I'm an accountant, but I'm seeing what these two trainers are doing. And one of those, my coach, like, what's that all about? You know, it just doesn't look good. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, like just all of that is just to say that like, you know, there's eyes everywhere and there's so much more. It goes beyond just being able to spew out fitness content and have a battle for what's the most accurate or what's the most researched or what's the right stuff and what's the wrong stuff. Like the egos have got to go and all that stuff has got to go when you remember the human component of this. And, you know, that was the point that you made to be a good human being. Um, and that's, that's going to go a much further way. Um, and there's ways to handle disagreements. There's ways to handle, I don't like this content other than just, Oh, let me, let me just mop the floor with this guy on the internet. I don't, I don't really respect that myself. And, you know, I'm happy to say that it's not my style or my MO to do that around the industry. There's no need to, to do that, you know? Well, I mean, as a way to kind of circle back and give people some takeaways to this whole discussion, some of the things that I've realized is like, even the people that care about me the most in life inside or outside of the industry, they're not going to agree with everything that I say. I'm not always going to be like correct in my delivery or my context understanding. Like I'm going to get things wrong. And so that's sort of like a normal thing. And then as time goes on within the fitness space, what I'm learning is like, it's a lot easier for me to put out content through like an article to my email list or through like uh, audio or video through like a podcast or YouTube video. And when I do that, that actually helps me towards some of my other goals. Whereas I don't really have a goal to have a lot of Instagram followers. So if I put out something with too much context that can be taken out of context on Instagram, then it's not going to help me in any way. Like if I had 20,000 followers, it wouldn't phase me too much personally. I know it's something for other people, but for me, it's just like, I'd almost rather 
have people that I know listen to the podcast in full. And so what I've learned is to just know that no matter what direction or how polished or how researched I am, like I'm probably only going to be 60% right. And that's totally okay. And I'm going to have to kind of deal with like what happens with that 40%, whether it be that people want to just directly bring it up and then we work through it. Like that happened throughout my entire training career. Like I've always got a little something wrong and then I learn and I adapt. Like yeah. sometimes clients give feedback and like this exercise doesn't work for me. And it's like, oh, all right, we're just going to have to change it because yeah. that exercise doesn't work. Yeah. Um, and with that, the direction that I've taken is just realized, okay, what what is the thing that I can leverage the most? And for me, it's like long form articles using my Substack platform, which is where I host the podcast now. And it's being able to use my communication skills through like verbal form because people can tell through the tone of my voice or they can tell through the backstories that I add in where I'm coming from with the topic. Whereas if they see it through my Instagram and they just see how my profile might look to them, they totally take it out of context. Yeah, yeah. Um, so hopefully people are feeling brave enough to get started with whatever phase of their journey they're on. If it's like a new trainer or if it's just somebody just wanting to uh, be confident in some capacity. Yeah, uh, that's uh, such a good little thing that I almost forgot to talk about there. Uh, first of all, a conversation that I had with Andrew Coates of all people, um, he was talking about, you know, on the subject of, you know, like internet and, you know, arguing and all this stuff. And he was saying, you know, there are a lot of people out there who have high IQ, but they don't have high EQ, right? emotional quotients, right? Where you might say something that gets taken out of context just because they didn't hear or they can't ascertain your tone of voice. They can't understand the inflections that you were making when the, the nuances and the context that goes along with it, they just take the information as it is and then disagree with it, right? And uh, that's a really, really, you know, it's a, such an important and underspoken um, like uh, part of this all. Even if you're giving cues to a client, even if you're saying what you're going to program for a client and so on, like it goes a long way. Um, and second of all, to the point that you were saying about um, younger trainers and people who are listening in even now, um, but younger trainers, people who are just starting out in the industry. This is the thing that sort of like it, it it's the most kind of. Uh, I want to say, I don't want to say bothersome, but it's the, it's the most concerning. This is where it gets very sensitive as far as the information, not only what it's being delivered, but how it's being delivered. Because you have a young, and I work with students, right? So it's even twofold important to me uh, of a subject. When you have a young trainer who's just gotten into the industry, and they might be sort of looking for a place to belong, so to speak, where they're looking, okay, which people do I sort of pay attention to? Who's information? Who do I make the follow on? Who do I hit the follow button on? Whose stuff do I take in the most of? Because everybody sort of had their coach that is the main person they looked into. And then other people around that too. I know that I did. I had a little core group of people and then a little bit more. Um, so like, who, who am I really listening to, right? Okay, well, if you poise yourself in the industry as somebody who's got some experience, but you're the villain, you're the person who is going to be that hater. You're the person who in the name of the good information, you're going to be that that. Uh, anarchist or that hater or the person who has this kind of livery, right? Well, there's that young trainer out there who thinks now that this is the going norm or this is the best way to be in the industry to create the name for themselves they want to create or create the identity for themselves that they want to create. And that's dangerous, you know, because not only is it burning a lot of professional bridges, preemptively speaking, but it's also, it's not really, it doesn't give you the chance to practice being a good dude or chick or whatever, like it's not good, you're not being good. And I don't think that any of that behavior advances the industry like people all agree they want to do, you know? And so um, that's an important one because just like a child's mind is going to be a lot more fragile and a lot more, um, you know, impressionable when they don't know things about life. A young trainer's mind is going to be a lot more fragile, a lot more impressionable in terms of what to be like to become a good professional in the industry and one who makes a, a good career and a successful one and so on and so forth. So it uh, it definitely goes without saying that, I mean, if we're, if someone's in there, you know, eight years deep, 10 years deep, 12 years deep, 15, 16 years deep, like I am, you know, and they're in their thirties, you're first and foremost frontline showing the example for 
you know, the upcoming generation of trainers who are out there of, you know, what to be like, how to be, whether they like you or don't, you're an example for them. So how are you going to handle that inadvertent responsibility? How are you going to, what are you going to do about that? And it's a good question to ask a lot of people. And I'm sure a lot of people don't ask that question or don't consider it. And they think a little bit more self-centeredly when it comes to that. And uh, they, they shouldn't because it, it's a ripple effect that goes a lot further than uh, a lot of us are willing to admit. Well, I think the, the point that we can hammer home as we wrap up this episode is that like sometimes people don't think about like the frame of mind that they could end up being when they're in a struggle like 15 years into their career. Like I often, I don't know why my brain is like this, but oftentimes I'm like, okay, like in this fitness career, like what am I going to do when I face like loss, like really tough loss, like 15 years in and like, how am I going to handle that? when my whole identity is around just always showing up, always being solid. Like, am I going to be surrounded by empathetic, emotionally intelligent people who are able to kind of like step in and like help me and support me through that? Kind of similar to how a lot of people that I look up to supported the St. Clair family. Or am I going to be surrounded by people who just don't know what to do when somebody's struggling? And so for me, my priority has always been about learning the lessons that other people have with regards to resilience around that and looking for character in the people that I surround myself with. Because I know that like, I'm in the industry for the long game. I want to be doing this for a long, long time. I want to learn. I want to always be on top of like the areas that I can improve on and surround myself with people better and smarter than me. But in order to do that over an extended period of time, being humans that we are, that are aging and going through all these things, like what if one of us gets Alzheimer's one day, like all these different things that happen to humans, um, we have to have like a very supportive network and we have to have certain like soft skills that aren't presented oftentimes very well through social media because that's a short-term game, short-term gains. And if we look at a lot of the, the troublesome behavior and we looked at them 10 years from now, um, they might not be traveling to do in-person podcasts and they might not have the opportunities to go to the CN Tower and also make an income on the bus on the way there, like little things like that, that like pay off and those are the product of quality connections, quality relationships, empathy, communication skills, et cetera. So hopefully people got something from our conversation today. Yeah, definitely. Um, and as far as like chasing follows and all that stuff on social media, you think that if you have a certain number, then you're going to be happy with that. And uh, it just, it's a slot machine. Like it does, it's going to get the best of us. It. It's going to get the worst of us, no matter what, if you have 500 people, Who's going to say no if they say, okay, well, what if you want 750? Of course you want something. Why not? It's a bigger, bigger I have 40 something thousand. If someone said, give me 50, give me a hundred. You're like, yeah, of course. But and that's the thing. Like that's the short term gain. That sort of that gratification that you get in the very short term that uh, you got to be aware of it. And it's not something that ever goes away. So if you get caught up in that and get caught up in the fact that that fake world isn't real. Like, I mean, there's a lot of real parts of it. There's, in general, it's, it's a fabricated life that's been created. People post their highs. People uh, can be mean to each other and crass with each other and not have any sort of uh, uh, what's the word, ramifications for doing so. It's false. So being able to separate or distance yourself from that where necessary uh, and when necessary is going to be probably one of the greatest uh, weapons that you can have in this game and probably outside of this game as well. I don't know what other industries are like where social media use is concerned, but I know this is a big one and uh, it can get very contentious. And so we've got to watch out for that. Absolutely. And with that, thank you so much for coming back on the show and for hosting us today. Yeah, no problem, man. Sweet.